first of all, I would like to thank Barry and all the organizers for inviting me here and uh, for this beautiful conference. It's, uh, it's great to be here. So today I will uh, I will speak about uh, our work of multiphoton correlation interferon and application in quantum information processing. This is, by the way, a view that we can have from our institute in all uh, in Germany. Uh, so we can see all the Alps here. So just to attract you to come to visit us. <laughs> so let's... Um, is that fake? <laughs> no, it is true. Precisely, I lived in Ulm for a year. So, uh, so, I will, my, so as I said, my basic uh, topic is multiphoton correlation interferometry. And uh, uh, I will speak, uh, my talk will, uh, in the second part, I will speak briefly about what we did with multimode thermal sources. While in the first part, we will focus about uh, interferometry with the arbitrary single photon pure states. So, why multiphoton correlation interferometry is interesting? First of all, it's, I mean, I don't need to say to this audience, but it's, it's uh, from an experimental point of view, now we have all the technology to really um, have, uh, to really shape the photon as we, as we want, and uh, we have fast detector to really get, uh, uh, to retrieve the information, the total quantum alphabet in, in, uh, in the spectrum of a photon, just doing correlation measurement. And that's it's interesting from a fundamental point of view, uh, and uh, from a practical point of view for application in quantum metrology, quantum information. Here I will focus about three main results that we that we obtain. <coughs> I will show how we can get ten photon quantum bits and higher dimension bits through multiphoton correlation interferometry, and also n photon entanglement co uh, correlation, also with photons that can be distinguishable from each other. And then I will introduce. Uh, I mean, we heard in this, in, this, in this conference a lot about boson sampling from John, from Andrew, uh, and, and from the different speakers here, and I think we will hear from you maybe. And uh, so we'll introduce a, a new problem, uh, more general, we call multi boson correlation sampling, and we will compare with the boson sampling. So let's start uh, with the, the basic background. So here I will basically speak about this paper that uh, uh, should be published very soon. And what we did here with uh, my student Simon here, we treat um, a generical unitary transformation in a linear interferometer, true and port linear interferometer. And we, ask, uh, and we, uh, we consider uh, uh, the, in each of the end port a single photon that can be in an, ar in an arbitrary quantum state that is defined in this way. So this vector, psi s, with s that runs from 1 to capital N, is uh, defines, this direction defines the polarization of the photon, and this magnitude defines the, the, the temporal and frequency spectra of the photon. So for example, for Gaussian, uh, uh, distribution, you, you have everything, you have the central frequency, the, the value of the photon, the, the time of emission, everything, you can encode that. And so, of course, you can rewrite the state in this way, where e lambda is a given polarization base that, uh, that you can choose. So this is general uh, single photon pure states in my input here. What I do, uh, I do the, the approximation that actually works for our supposed sampling network is that I have equal propagation times. For, so for any possible path takes the same time. Right? Actually, people said you disregard the time itself. You don't need to do that. The important thing is just that it's constant, right? Uh, and so what we do now is that uh, we do correlation measurements in time and in polarization. So, of course, and why, why this is interesting, I mean, physically speaking, we have our detector there, and they are going to click a certain time, and you can also resolve the polarization in a given polarization base. So why throw out that information? Let's look at that and see what physics is we, we, we can learn from it. To describe this problem, so what we need to do now is determine what, what is the, the basic object in this context, is the n order Glauber correlation function, but now for pure states, for single photon pure states, and is basically the well-known uh, object in which we have like this field operator at the detectors, will be that goes from one to n, and then of course since we are uh, 
looking at correlation measuring in polarization, we need to project over the polarization that we detect, and these are the time of detection. Okay? So this is the basic object you, that you determine. And then, of course, the physics of, of, the, of the, these correlation measurements correspond to the physics of multiphoton interference. Basic, you have n factorial n photon detection amplitude in the language that uh, uh, that Glauber would use that interfere with it, with itself. And uh, and so what you carry out the calculation, you can see that the correlation uh, function has a very nice compact formulation. And uh, here again we see our friend permanence. <laughs> we have a lot about that. And uh, we we have the modulo square of this permanent. Now this matrix tau. That depends, of course, on the detection time now and on the detected polarization. So different from boson sampling, to which you just integrate over time. You don't consider, you throw out the information. Now we, we take all the information possible from our experiment. So we have, and this, this matrix now depends not only, in this case, on the, on the interferometer matrix, so on the, on the linear transformation U, but depends also on the scalar product between the polarization that we have detected, PD, and, the, and, the, and this vector, PS, TD, that define the source and the detected time, this is just the Fourier transform of the, of the spectral distribution of the photons, of course, delayed by the time delta T of propagation, okay? So very simple. So we have all the information in this matrix, yeah. the propagation through the interferometer, the time of detection, polarization, and also how the, the spectral distribution of the photon gets get into the gate. And so this, in principle, you can describe anything, any, any possible interferometer, any possible input uh, uh, single photon states, and what you get through these correlation measurements is a compact distribution now of arbitrary, what we call multi-photon correlation landscapes. So this is a nice formalist that describes now the physics of this system very general. How can we use it? And what, which physics can we learn from it? <coughs> to, to understand that, let's just look at a simple example. Uh, so this is a, a particular unitary transformation. And I consider in the case of indistinguishable photon. What does it mean indistinguishable photon for me? It means that uh, the overlapping between the spectral distribution that now, as I said, are defined by this CS omega vector, can be anything. Uh, so define the polarization and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the frequency temporal distribution of the photons. This is almost equal to one. Okay, so these these photons are, are that are distinguishable for this, for it, for, from each other. They have equal polarization. Now uh, we consider this setup because the permanent of this human unitary, unitary matrix is equal to zero, and we learn. Uh, <coughs> Already that, for, for example, one of the recent Yonggu Mandel effect give the dip that we know is because the permanent of, of, of the bin split uh, transformation is zero. So what we expect in this case is that for indistinguishable photo we have destructive quantum interference. Nothing, nothing to learn, right? But an interesting question we can ask of ourselves. What, what about the case in which the photons now are, uh, <coughs> are distinguishable for each other, for example, in the frequency? So let's think about Gaussian distribution. We have equal coherence time, equal time of emission, but the central frequency, with, with the, the, the photon and central frequency very much apart from each other with respect to the band. So they are distinguishable in their frequency. And we do three-fold correlation, the three, three-fold detection here, but not resolving in time. So what happened in that case? Nothing is, no multi photon interference is going to occur. The photons are, 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 are distinguishable from each other. <coughs> Just lift it higher. And I think the battery died. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It went out is really it better? Oh, okay. Rockstar, sorry. Oh, sorry. Is it better? Oh, can you hear me now? I guess so. So, so but the interesting part comes here. What happens is we consider the same case. But we do time time uh, uh, resolving detection, okay? So the same setup, and the photons are distinguishable in their frequency. But we do time resolving detection, and we look at the correlation function in this case. And what we see, we are we plot in the case 
the, 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 the threefold correlation function, that what, what that does it represent? It's the rate of detection in, 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 uh, as a function of, uh, per time, per second, right? And this is plotted as a function of the relative time between the, the, the second and the first channel. Is it So, uh, so higher, 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 higher. Is it better? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Okay. So, um, so what I was saying is that now we look at the same uh, situation where the photons are distinguishable in their frequency, and we, we, uh, and we do now three threefold. Cor uh, correlation measurements, but in time, in, in a time-resolving way, and we look at the rate as a function of time, and we plot it here as a function of the relative time between the, the second and the first channel and between the third and the first channel. And what we observe here is that uh, we don't have, we, we, we can look, we can see quantum interference here. In, for, in the case, for example, in which we have equal detection times, we can see that we can we can look at uh, we, we have uh, like a three uh, photon deep that is a generalization of of the two photon deep and uh, uh, and the reason for that is that by doing the time resolving correlation measurements we we are able to make the photon indistinguishable again and and and, from, and another interesting thing is that from the deep we can see that uh, quantum bits depart from it. And these quantum bits have an oscillation and now depends on the relative frequency between the photon, the relative sequence, the central frequency between the photon, but also on the evolution through the interferometer. So this is a purely quantum effect that we would not be able to observe if we would not resolve in, in time. We would, if we would throw away the information about the detection times in the interferometer. And so the... Uh, this information is, in, is, in, so it is interesting from the fundamental point of view, but can be used in principle uh, to zoom in now in the end photon quantum state and in its evolution. So on their state and how they evolve through the interferometer. Because as I said, these bits now depends on, gives you information about the relative frequency of the photon and the coherence time of the photon and also what is the structure of the unitary transformation. So this is the first interesting thing that, uh, that we, we can show through, through our uh, formulas. The second thing I want to show you is that uh, uh, how can we build entanglement correlations even with photons that can be distinguishable or partially distinguishable with each other. <coughs> so look, let's look at another particular uh, transformation, just a symmetric three-port pin splitter, a generalization to n equal three of a balanced pin splitter. By the way, all of what I'm showing here, I'm going to doing for the case n equal three, but in, in general, we did for any pos it, it works for any possible uh, dimension of uh, my unitary transformation. So it's simple to understand that if we have now single photons here that are indistinguishable in their spectra, and that polarization H, H, and B, if we do threefold detection here, what we are post selecting is a W uh, state, right? Since this is a three, a three for, uh, it's like a treater, a balanced treater. <coughs> but we need indistinguishable photons in their spectra. What happens again if we do, if we consider photons that, again, I'm just giving an example here, photon distinguishable in their, in their frequency. So what happens is that if I don't, if I just do joint measurements without resolving in time, I will not see any entanglement correlation. That's clear, right? So that's not good. What about doing time resolving detection? I use the same interferometer, the same input, distinguishable photon in frequency, and now I do <coughs> time correlated measurements. And I consider the case in which one channel is detected in the H polarization. And then I do type of band measurements in the other two, or beta and alpha, the other two polarization. And what you get, this is the plot that describes the rate of threefold detection as a function of the time of detection and alpha plus beta. So we have considered the case of equal detection time. 
And in this case, you can see that uh, at any of the, of the time, as long as we are looking at equal detection time, we see 100% bell correlations. And these are the signature that we are looking at a correlation of the, of the type of the W states. So again, we can recover the distinguishability, the indistinguishability in the photons that is necessary to, to get the, 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 the polarization quantum correlation that we were not able to achieve when we, when we just were throwing out information about the detection time. So this is very important because from an experimental point of view, you, uh, you know, you, you never have photons that are identical in their spectra. Uh, you, the photon can have any kind of spectra, any kind of polarization. But still, <laughs> again, Andrew is actually laughing at me, he says, that, that's true, right? <laughs> so it's, it's interesting that you can still do some kind of measurements that allows you, no matter what, to recover that indistinguishability in the lab. So, third application of, of, of this formalism, as I said, we heard a lot about boson samples, so I'm not going <laughs> to speak too much in detail about it. Uh, but uh, what, let me just tell the problem uh, introduced by, by Aronson and Darkipov. So we have our unitary transformation. Now the difference before I choose like I, all the input modes, only input channels were <coughs> occupied, right? Now I choose the case in which only n input channels are occupied with respect to the total number of channels, capital M, and then is much larger than M. <coughs> and then what the problem consists in in sampling over the output distribution, so that we know the n photon, if n is much less than M, are gonna come out in n channel. And the output that are defined by this sample D is, is a sample of n channel, that you can have all the possible samples. A U sample over the output distribution. What are the, re the requirements for this problem? First of all, indistinguishable photons. I need to have a random unitary transformation group. I need to have a number of total channel capital M much larger than the, the number of occupied channels. And I, I start to see that things get complicated classically if I go larger uh, of 30, right? And the other thing is we don't use non-resolving detection. When I say non-resolving detection, I'm just seeing where the photons are coming out. I don't care about their polarization, I don't care about their time. That's the, the problem defined by Aronson and Darkipov. And he showed that, uh, first of all, the probability of, of uh, detecting uh, the, the n photon in a particular, given an input configuration S, to detect them in a particular sample D, depends on the permanent of the sum matrix associated to the input configuration and the, and the output sample, right? And and and, uh, and so this so and then you can sh they, they show in their paper the 90-page paper that uh, that uh, John uh, mentioned so many times. <laughs> The boson sampling interferometry is R2 simulator, okay? But again, the requirement here are indistinguishable photon or resolving detection. What about considering the actual experimental case that Andrew like arbitrary single photon pure states? And why not at this point, instead of throwing out the information where the, where, at what time the photon are, are detecting the polarization that the, that we are detecting, taking that into account. So that leads us to a more general problem, what we call multi-boson correlation sampling, in which we are not only sampling, like in the case of Aronson, over the, out, only on, over the output channels where the detector occurs, but also on the time where the detector can click. We don't know when the detector is gonna click, so all the possible time are possible, so the sampling, is, is it possible also to sample over the time and the polarization? So we use the same, you know, the same the single fold of pure state and we carry out uh, the, the, the calculation and understand how this problem would work, okay? So again, this boils down to calculate the correlation function for a given time of detection and given polariz uh, polarization that we detect. And this again depends on, on the modulo square of a single permanent. It's not just the permanent of the matrix, some matrix U, like in the case of Aronson and Darkipov. Now, we have this matrix 
T depends again on the detected time, on the polarization that we are detecting, on the input configuration and the, and the output for configuration for the channels. And it gives, it, it has the terms that depends on the U itself, but also terms that depend on the detected polarization and on, on this key vector S that again, as I told you before, is the Fourier transform of the spectral distribution of the input photons. Was the detected time <coughs> yes. treated as a continuum? As you can, we, here we treat it as a continuum. You can, do, you can discretize it if you like. So you're doing correlations between two times that are real numbers? The, we, we, do we, we do an order correlations. Yeah, the time are yeah. real numbers. The probability of two photons arriving at the same time exactly with real number time is zero. The photon arriving at the same time with real number time is it's zero. It's you are consider all the possible data detection time. You are consider anything. You, you, you are, we are in the case experiment. You're talking about probability densities. That's yes, right? that's what it is. So if you want to speak, of, so basically experimental, if we want to go to the experiment, you are considering the integration time of the detector, that's much less than the coherence time. And so you get like a, a delta. A probability is you need to multiply by delta t, and this gives you the probability in that delta t of integration time. Okay? So that's, that's the problem, and that's the compact uh, result that we get. Again, it, it depends on, it's more sophisticated with respect to the case of Aronson and Archibald. And of course, if you consider that the photons are identical with each other, what does it mean? That all these keys are equal, so this term factor out, and you get back the result of Aronson for, for equal photons. But the physics is much more interesting when we consider photons that are the ones that are in the lab, really. So what's the, what, what can we say about the complexity of this problem? So one thing that we can, we can notice, it's interesting that, uh, as I said, you are sampling in time. If you consider in the class of time samples, the one in which the, 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 the times of detection are equal with respect to each other, of course, within the coherence time of, of, of the photons experimentally, what you get that uh, our expression reduced now on the modulo square of the permanent of UDS, the one we are used to in the boson sampling, multiplied by a constant now. Well, if this constant is different from zero, what does it mean that? It means that uh, the multi-photon amplitudes that concur to the interference and the detection partially overlap in time and polarization, so this guy is different from zero. We can understand that now this class of samples contains all the samples that Aronson has in his problem, right? And, this, and, and so you can easily, just following the result of Aronson, if he is right in his conjecture, of course, that our problem, what we define as multi-boson correlation sampling, is classically difficult to simulate, even now for multi-photon amplitude that are partial, just partially overlapping in time and polarization. You, we don't need identical photons anymore. And still, you can show, if you don't throw out the information about the detection time, that this problem is really computationally hard. So one <coughs> can ask himself, OK, you're, uh, what happened in the case in which we throw again away the information about time and polarization? Is that computationally hard? Well, we don't know. <laughs> But let me tell you one thing. What, what do you do in that case, right? We calculate the correlation for that's coming back on uh, what the correlation function means, right? It's a rate per time. Now you need to integrate my correlation function over all the possible detection time. That's what, what actually has been done so far in the lab. You no know, time resolving measurement has been done. So now you come back to actually the formalism of Aronson with the difference that we are not using any, more, any, any way identical photons, but we are using still arbitrary single photon pure state. Let's look at the problem in the integrated case. You carry out the calculation, you get a very compact formulation of the probability now. What is this? I call it average because basically you are kind of classically averaging over the degree of freedom in time and in polarization. And this is the probability for each possible sample defined by D, of the sample of detected uh, channels, 
and this given by this expression. Now this is independent on time and polarization because I throw that information away. Now you don't get a just single permanent like in Aronson for, for the case of indistinguishable photons. Basically you get the sum of permanents, an expression that is given by a sum of permanents where the sum occurs over all the possible M element, over all the possible permutation in the symmetric group of order M. And this sum, it, it, each, each permanent here is defined by this permutation, is given by, by this matrix here. So it's, A is defined by the, the sample D, the input configuration S, and by the permutation that I'm looking at. And it does not depend anymore by, it, by the single element U of the matrix, like in Aronson case. But you see, you have the interference term here. S is the channel, is the index of the sources, D of the detector, right? And this is the permutation row. So this is a matrix defined like this. Then you sum over all the possible matrix with weights <coughs> that now depends on how, how the photon distinguishable they are. And this de defined by this object, what we call the photon indistinguishability factor, is the product over all the possible, um, uh, from S that goes from all the possible index in the input, right? Of this overlapping, wise photon overlapping factor, that is the, what I defined in the, in, the, in the first slide. Again, you remember, the CS, what was it? It was the polarity, define the polarization of the photon in the direction and it reminds you to define everything. You can define uh, the, the bandwidth, the, the, the central uh, frequency of the photon, the time of emission. Now, the distinguishability of the photons comes into the play in the weight of this permanent. What is the complexity of this, of this object? We, we don't know, at least I, I don't know. What we know is that if you go to the case of complete distinguishability, okay, in the case of complete distinguishability, what does it mean? That this is zero for S different from S prime. If the two photons, we are looking at two different photons, S prime, this is zero. In that, in that case, in that case, now, the, uh, the, that sum of permanents reduced to a single permanent. So the only case that survived is when the, the permutation is the identity. You need to have S and S here, right? Otherwise, the weight for this permanent is going to be zero. So the only the permanent surviving this sum is to draw is the identity. What is that? <laughs> is the matrix which elements now are, are the modulo square of the elements of, of the matrix of our own. So, so this is a problem computationally trivial. We, we get that result already uh, obtained by Jerome Sinclair and Bigoda. When, when the thing we know that is interesting is when there is complete indistinguishability. And in that case, what does it mean? All these factors are one. So all the weight here are one. You sum this permanent with the same weight, and what you get at the end is a single permanent that is the one we are used to. And this is the key, what, we, what is the Aronson and Archibald boson sampling that we know that is hard to simulate, right? So let we know these two cases. What about the, the more general case? We don't know yet what is the complexity of this object. But what we know, as I showed you before, is that if I generalize the problem, to a problem in which I do sample in time and polarization, I can still say something. In the case in which I integrate, I don't know yet the answer. But maybe Barry can know the answer and can tell me. <laughs> no, but, so, I, but maybe I can ask you that. Sure. Um, you know how before, so the, the issue of whether mm -hmm. your correlation functions were probably density function, <coughs> uh, so they are, they, yeah. they get plugged in integrals. Yeah. And then whether two photons are in two paths are distinguishable or not, if your integration time of your detector is infinite, in, like yeah. in my work, yeah. um, then it doesn't matter when they arrive. Sure. I can't tell in yours. Yeah, that's that's what, what you are saying is when your integration time is infinite, you're you're doing this. Okay. So you're integrating over all the possible detection time. So two photons are indistinguishable even if they arrive at different times. They can be. Two photons. The only definition of indistinguishability is this okay. one for me. Okay. Yeah. I'm that's, happy with that. that. That's the only thing. Mathematically, I, I'm, this, I'm, I'm looking at this as distinguishability. But, but this is a good question because the requirement now for me for multi-boson correlation sampling 
is just this requirement. I want that this, the, the, this object here is different from zero. What this means, this is, remember, is the Fourier transform of the spectral distribution of the photon. And, this, and, and the scalar product, of course, with the polarization, I, I'm looking at equal polarization detection. So this define, really, the, the multi-photon amplitudes that trigger the interference. So if the photons at the detector are overlapping in time and polarization, that's enough for me. I don't even need the, the concept of distinguishability, right? It's, even, it's a weaker condition, let's put it this way. When, when I do the, the, the case in which I integrate, I get troubles, or at least I don't know the answer. That's my, was my point, but thanks for your question. So let's, I guess in, in, the, in, the, in the minutes that I have uh, left, I will just want to give you a little bit of uh, an insight about our work on multiple mode thermal source. So I asked myself, you know, like John was telling, let's try all the possible states, right? Well, let's, let's, this is the most natural and classical state that you can see. So let's see what happened. And uh, basically, we were more motivated about the physical understanding of the problem. So we want to, to describe arbitrary arbitrary brown twist effect. Now, for arbitrary order, arbitrary interferometer. And then I will speak about how we can do a control not gate interferometer simulated. <laughs> So this is this paper that I did with Simon. And uh, so basically the problem is the same, right? You have a unitary transformation, and now you have thermal sources independent from each other here, from one to capital M. I'm not taking a particular setting because you can always put the average <coughs> photo number rate to zero and then you get whatever you want, so you do it generally. And, and what defines the thermal source is also, as you know, the spectral distribution of the source, right? CS, omega, it can be anything, right? And I do again, what is, let's try to, to describe this problem. This problem is described by what? Again, by the correlation function that all the possible gen detection that I can have at the output. Where n can be any number that goes from 1 to capital N, right? And, the, and the already Glauber showed that this is given by, <laughs> simply by the, the first order correlation function. And what does this look like? It's a permanent. <laughs> so the gn, is a, is a, it can be right again to, to, as a permanent, and this is the definition, of course, we know first order correlation function for a thermal source is a field operator. But you carry out the calculation, and you can see that now the GN, apart from a constant, is proportional again to what? A permanent. And so it's a permanent in which now, the, but this pen, what, what, what's the values, of, what, what this, this matrix here? This matrix now depends on the other mark product of two matrices, the point wise product this A matrix, and this key, TD prime minus TD. Key is the Fourier transform of the spectral distribution of the source, calculated at the time of detection, D prime and D. And A, D, D prime is now de de defined by this. We have the, the, the sub matrix of, of Aronson, plus this diagonal matrix in the rate of, these are the rate of photon production for the source, and this is the other matrix. You can show that this, both A and B are positive semi-definite matrices. And, one, and so you can, you, you, first of all, you can understand it, you know, that you don't need to necessarily have a permanent to say that the problem is complicated. For this class of matrices, uh, it doesn't need to be like that. But more interestingly for us is that uh, we have a compact description now of a problem, arbitrary order, arbitrary brown twist. Since I am a physicist, I'm more interested in that. <laughs> and the, and the, the arbitrary linear, we, we can describe that for arbitrary linear interferometer and, and, and thermal source with arbitrary spectrum. And so we can make uh, arbitrary brown here very happy. <laughs> so, as a final thing, so, we, so, so, so sure. If it can, though, I just want to understand. Is it hard to compute that matrix or not, or you don't know? Okay, actually, the, the the, while we were working, at the same time we were working on this, uh, Raimi, Kashari, Lund, and, and Ralph did, did the similar work, but not with correlation measurements, and they, and uh, basically in their case, they were looking at uh, like monochromatic sources. They were not interested in number ground twist. And so the fact that you have thermal light brought them to the conclusion that this class of, 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 should, of, of, of be, uh, should be trivial. It's, to it's in P instead of... Well, I, uh, the, 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 no. 
What well, I think about that in Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> let's, we'll hear about that in your talk. Very yeah, good. yeah. So what we did is is a more general approach in which we do arbitrary thermal source, multi-mode thermal source. We were interested in number of ground twists. Expert, but we of course get also positive semi definite matters. You can get to the conclusion too. But yeah, <laughs> but this is an interesting question, you know, the, to, uh, to, I think to understand uh, in general. Um, so let's, the, the final thing, CNOT gate, I mean, this audience, I don't need to explain what the CNOT gate here is, it was just an ex uh, example for uh, uh, how you can get through a CNOT gate, a bell state, and uh, you know, if you have a 45 degree photon here and the H photon here, you get a bell state, and then if you do cor polarization correlation measure, you get bell correlation. That's how a C0 gate works. We all know that this is, we learn, it's a hard uh, gate to, to, to produce. There are a lot of challenges. We need to have uh, indistinguishable single photons. We need to have complex interferometer with ancilla photons. If we follow the KLM approach, we need to overcome the coherence. It's a lot of uh, open question. So, as what we were interested is to see, uh, in the meantime, while well, all of this is, is, uh, is achieved, why don't we look at the case in which we can really simulate uh, a CNOT gate, but now using a source that is, for us, for free, again, a thermal source. And we consider in this paper that is in, on the archive here, we did this work with Johannes, so the, a, a particular interferometer, we have a thermal source, and we do correlation measurement here, but now not in the photon numbers, but in the fluctuations of the number of photons, okay? So let me go just in the detail on the, just a little bit so you get an insight. So you have a source here, you go through the bin splitter, okay? And then I encode the VC and VT. This is the control interferometer, this is the target interferometer. The source here was H polarized. Now I rotate to the VC general polarization, here to the VT target general polarization. And I have now two unbalanced Franson type of interferometer. The basis different here is that here I have polarizing bin splitter and here I have normal bin splitter. And here I, 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 I do a flipping polarization, okay? So you, you and then I, I look at the detection, it's a polarization correlation measure with the detection, that's the way to how in general you see if it's not works. And the only requirement is that I do Detection at almost equal time. What does it mean equal time physically? That the relative time here compared with the coherence time is, is, much, is, is, much, is much less compared with the coherence time. So if you do this type of measurement, you effectively, when you calculate the, 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 the correlation fluctuation uh, here at the output, you get only two terms that survive. The term in which this G1 term in which uh, the, the photon goes both in the long path, like in the in Franson interferometer, or the other in which the both goes in the, in, the, in the short path, okay? But if the control goes in the, in the long path, it means that it's a vertical. We are looking at the vertical amplitude for the control, okay? For the target, you are looking now at this path where a flip of polarization occurs. Now, if the control goes to the H path, uh, to the short path, it, you're, you're looking at now, the, the, to, the, to the short path is only the H uh, polarized amplitude that it goes through. But this is correlated uh, with, with, the, with the short path here where no polarization flip occurs. So you can see that uh, when you calculate the, 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 the fluctuations, the, the correlation within the number of fluctuation of photon, for, 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 uh, uh, you do it in polarization, now you get the superposition of these two G1 terms that correspond to long, long, and short, short, but this correspond to this, you can show it. If you do, for example, in the, in the case I show you for H45, you calculate PC0 for a normal C0 gate, you can show that this is proportional to the, to the probability of the C0. So effectively, you are reproducing the effect of the C0. Of course, this is not at the single photon level. But, but, but you, can, you can reproduce this effect uh, now just exploiting the physics of multi-photon interference for thermal light. is the basic physics of Ambury Brown twist that, that, that is used here to, 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 to get non-trivial co correlation in these correlation measurements that allows to simulate the CNOT operation. 
I will not get time to get into the detail of this, but you can ask questions if you like. But with this, I want to conclude my talk. So what I show you is that we had a, a general approach to describe uh, multi-photon interference for time and polarization resolving measurement, but also in the integrated case. We show how the, our approach allows to, to get interesting <coughs> physics, what we call arbitrary order quantum beams, arbitrary order dips, and how this can be used to zoom in in n photon quantum state evolution through any kind of interferometer. We show how you can achieve n photon entanglement correlation, even for photons that are, uh, that are not identical. And we also introduce what we call the multi boson correlation sampling problem. We show how, if Aronson and Archipov are right in their conjecture, this is complicated also for photons that are not completely indistinguishable. And we compare it with the boson sampling problem for, for, for photon of arbitrary single photon states. And finally, I show also how we can get generalized Amory Brown disk correlation. And we can use thermal light through correlation measurement to simulate a synaptic interferometer. With this, thank you for your help. First of all, I want to thank also my students, especially uh, Johannes and Simon. These are the two papers that Master have spoken about. Sure.